In an earlier video, we discussed how Roman expansion was fueled by what the anthropologist David Graeber called the military coinage slavery complex, a system where coin money was used to finance military expansion that led to the production of even more coins. The end result was, in the words of the historian Jack Weatherford, the world's first empire organized around money. Prior to the medieval period, much of Europe was governed by this empire of money, a society where even common people use coin money as their principal means of exchange, and where wealthy Romans loaned money at interest, establishing an early banking system. But this system would not withstand the fall of the Roman Empire. This is the butterfly's wing, where we look at seemingly small things with unexpectedly large impacts. By the 11th century, the average European was no longer a Roman citizen used to handling coins with an emperor's face on them. Instead, most Europeans were serfs who rarely, if ever, used coin money. Europe had regressed back to a society without banking institutions. The limited amounts of coin money in circulation were used primarily by rulers, nobles, church officials, and merchants. It's impossible to adequately describe this medieval society without discussing the role of the Catholic Church. After the Roman Empire fell, the Catholic Church remained the only institution with pan-European influence. Included in Catholic dogma at the time was a prohibition against usury, often defined during the period as a charging of any amount of interest on a loan. Under this mindset, money was to be loaned as an act of goodwill toward borrowers, not as a means of profit for lenders. Money wasn't seen as something that could naturally reproduce itself over time, so loaning money and requiring repayment above the original principal was considered sinful. This ban on usury was essentially a ban on most of what we today think of as banking services. But medieval Europe, with its small states and Christian faith, contained the seeds of the greatest accelerant for monetary innovation, military conflict. In 1095, at the Council of Claremont, Pope Urban II declared the First Crusade against the Seljuk-led Turks, who controlled the Holy Land and threatened Byzantine Orthodox Christians. This crusade was ultimately successful for the Christians, leading to the development of Crusader kingdoms in the Levant and the opening up of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Protecting Christian pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land became a new priority for the Catholic Church, leading to the development of Catholic military orders, religious societies composed of monks, some of whom were also warrior knights. The most noteworthy of these orders was the Knights Templar. Founded in 1119, the Knights Templar controlled multiple fortresses across Europe and the Holy Land. Control of these fortresses combined with the Templars' vows of poverty, put the Templars in an excellent position to begin accepting deposits from wealthy Christians who trusted the Templars to safeguard their money. To help protect Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land from theft, the Templars also developed a system for international money transfers. A pilgrim could deposit money with a Templar branch in the pilgrim's home country, then, for a fee, withdraw money from a branch in the Holy Land. This service functioned very much like the flying cash system used in China during the Tang Dynasty, discussed in the previous video. The Templars also acted as an intermediary for payments between third parties, debiting one depositor's account, adding the funds to a different account. For example, when England's Henry III purchased Oleron Island from the Count of March, Henry made arrangements for the Templars to receive his payments in London over a five-year period. The Templars then credited the Count of March's account, allowing the money to travel virtually instead of physically. The Templars came to offer a whole range of financial services to both individuals and governments. For a time, both the English and French crowns entrusted their royal treasuries with the Templars. England's crown jewels were kept not in the Tower of London, but in Temple Church, London. The Templars were even entrusted with tax collection duties in England, and they offered estate settlement services, annuities, tradable bond-like instruments, and loans. But all of these services had to conform to the Catholic Church's ban on usury, 
meaning the Templars couldn't charge interest for any of their services. One workaround was the use of a medieval financial instrument called a bailiwick. A bailiwick, also called a census or rent, was a contractual arrangement to turn over the yield of a certain piece of land over a specific time period. So instead of a monarch agreeing to make an interest payment on a loan from the Templars, which could be considered usury, he might instead issue the Templars a bailiwick as part of the loan agreement that would end up paying the Templars a similar amount of money as an interest payment would have paid, without technically violating the church's ban on usury. Given all the financial services the Knights Templar offered, it's appropriate to think of them as one of the first European banking institutions of the post-Roman era. But they were not the only institution during the period to offer banking services. Jewish merchant bankers also issued loans during this time. While Jews of the period also recognized similar religious prohibitions against usury, some considered the ban on interest charges to apply only to loans made to fellow Jews. Loans to Christians could include interest charges. Christian monarchs often allowed this loophole to their usury laws as a way to facilitate loans that otherwise would have been impossible. Italian merchants also offered loans and other financial services, often from wooden tables called banchi, from which we get the English word bank. Italian bankers often got around the church's ban on usury by charging late fees on loan payments. It became an unspoken custom that borrowers were expected to intentionally make late payments accompanied by a late fee. Borrowers who paid on time to escape this fee would be blacklisted from receiving loans again in the future. Italian bankers also generated profits through currency conversions, buying and selling private debt instruments called bills of exchange, charging holding fees for deposits, offering pawnbroking services, selling maritime insurance, and through real estate holding agreements similar to bailiwicks. Banking families such as the Medici's also established branch offices throughout Europe and operated their own systems for money transfers between these branches, similar to the Chinese flying cash and the Templar's money transfer system. Italian bankers were also early adopters of fractional reserve banking, a cornerstone of modern banking. With fractional reserve banking, Italian bankers lent out or invested more money than they held in cash reserves, essentially creating new so-called ink money out of thin air. When not done to excess, fractional reserve banking expanded the money supply, creating new wealth and potential for investment. But as the historian Kenneth Clark described, on some occasions, the failure of Italian bankers to maintain adequate cash reserves led to early bank runs and some of the first classic crashes in the history of capitalism. At times, over-exuberance with fractional reserve banking and money creation has also produced inflation, a concept we will return to in upcoming videos. Italy was also the site of one of the first interest-bearing loan arrangements between Christians. In 1172, the Venetian government, in order to help finance a naval fleet to liberate Venetian merchants, who had been taken hostage by the Byzantines, enacted a forced loan against its citizens, called the Presti. This loan differed from a tax in that those who were forced to pay it received the right to a 5% annual interest payment on the amount loaned to the state. By establishing the Presti, Venice created what is probably the world's first government bond. It should come as little surprise that this financial innovation happened in an Italian city-state like Venice. At the time, Venice was small and relatively weak, both externally and internally. To counter a much larger power like the Byzantine Empire, it needed to raise a large amount of money. And as a republic led by multiple merchant families rather than a strong, centralized monarch, Venice had internal political challenges to consider. Simply levying an expensive new tax wouldn't have been politically expedient. The Presti's promise of an interest payment made the forced transfer of private funds to the state more palatable and therefore politically possible. In 1262, Venice consolidated the Presti and its other debts into a single bond fund called the Montevecchio. Bonds paid a 5% annual interest rate in two annual installments. Bondholders could sell their bonds to anyone for any agreed upon price, leading to the creation of the world's first bond market at Rialto Square. These bonds were perpetual having no scheduled maturity date, though the Venetian government could retire some or all of the debt 
by buying bonds on the open market. At first glance, Venice's forced loan with its defined 5% interest rate would seem a clear violation of the church's prohibition against usury. And this new financial innovation did spark a great deal of controversy, especially amongst some Catholic thinkers of the scholastic school. One of the best arguments in favor of the acceptability of the Presti was the fact that it was forced. Usury was usually considered sinful because lenders supposedly took advantage of borrowers by charging them interest. Borrowers were generally considered the victims of usury, not the perpetrators. As a forced loan, those who collected the potentially sinful interest payments, Venetian citizens, did so through no choice of their own. In fact, it was the supposed victim of these interest fees, the Venetian state, that itself insisted on making these payments. Other reasons at least some medieval scholars found the prestige to be acceptable included the loan was necessary for the preservation of the Venetian state, since the loan was perpetual with no scheduled payoff date. Strictly speaking, it wasn't a loan and therefore not usurious. For these reasons, some scholars found the initial issue of the Presti to be acceptable, though some still found the resale of Presti bonds on the open market to be usurious, because in this instance, the person profiting off of the interest did so of their own volition. Other scholars said resale was acceptable, so long as the sale amount wasn't higher than the original amount paid to the state. Despite the objections of some scholars, Presti bonds traded regularly on the open market for a variety of prices. It's worth noting just how revolutionary this new technology was. And the invention of the government bond was indeed a new technology that created new financial possibilities. Virtually overnight, the Venetian state transformed itself into a perpetual debtor and its citizens into investors. As investors, Venetians had new possibilities open to them. They could go to the market at Rialto Square and speculate on bonds, to make money not through the sweat of their brow, but with their intellect and shrewdness. Venetians could buy bonds over time, then use the resulting income stream to finance a retirement. Or they could use the income to endow charities or fund merchant ventures. Suddenly, with all these new financial possibilities, adopting a growth mindset made sense. These developments challenged the existing medieval order. Old authorities, the church, kings, and nobles, who had presided over a society with few ways of creating wealth beyond agriculture, now found themselves threatened by a rising class of new investors and merchants, who found new ways to build wealth that challenged the strictest interpretations of Catholic dogma. And yet the allure of this new innovation was so strong, even high-ranking church officials speculated on Presti bonds. The invention of the government bond didn't just alter the lives of individuals. It also fundamentally changed the role of the state. Suddenly, citizens who held government bonds found they had a vested interest in the success of the state. Bond prices rose when the state was relatively secure and fell when it was threatened, such as in times of war. Citizens now had a financial incentive to make sure the government persisted and was well administered. This helped to strengthen Venice's republican form of government. And as we'll see in future episodes, systems of government with strong republican rather than monarchical institutions are especially well suited to succeed when issuing debt. In succeeding centuries, this fact would help solidify Europe on a path towards increasingly democratic institutions. Over time, as people became more accustomed to bonds and the interest they paid, the intellectual foundations that had supported a strict interpretation of the prohibition against usury began to soften. Scholars and government officials became more willing to accept arguments in favor of interest fees for loans. Increased merchant activity strengthened arguments in favor of interest as a just compensation for risk when loaning money. And the concept of lucrum cessens stipulated that an interest charge on a loan could be justified to compensate the lender for revenue that might have otherwise been made if the money had been invested elsewhere, perhaps if it had been invested in Presti bonds. This led to an understanding of one of the most important financial concepts, the time value of money. The recognition that the right to possess a sum of money over a certain period of time is worth more than the initial sum. 
the exact opposite idea expressed by a strict medieval interpretation against usury. Europe had come full circle, from a Roman empire of money to a church-dominated medieval society where the concept of interest was banned, back to a more money-based society, ripe for the development of modern capitalism. In our next episode, we'll turn our sights to the Americas to explore the rise of colonialism, including the discovery of a mountain of silver in modern-day Bolivia that led to a vast expansion in the use of government bonds in Europe, as well as a price revolution. Thanks for watching. In the early 1200s, when the Mongols under Genghis Khan invaded the northern Jin, the Jin printed large amounts of paper currency in an attempt to finance their defense. But this was ultimately unsuccessful, resulted in inflation, and ultimately failed to stop the Mongol conquest of Jin territory. While the Mongols were foreign to China, they were quick to adopt many Chinese customs and practices. As a nomadic people, they found transporting lightweight paper money to be a great improvement over heavy coin money.